All right. Uh, yeah, I'm Jake. I'm an alcoholic. Yeah, thanks for uh, inviting me, Ross. Uh, it's been, you know, good bumping into you here and there. And, you know, thanks for inviting me. My sobriety date is 10 10 20. I have a home group. It's the Oregon Statewide Young People's Meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We meet on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Pacific time. If you're on any of the YPA pages on Facebook, you've probably seen my flyer because I'm pimping that thing every week. At any rate, I have a service position. I'm the programs chair for the Oregon State Conference of Young People and Alcoholics Anonymous this year. It's going to be happening in October of this year in Independence, Oregon. It's going to be Halloween weekend. It's going to be a good time. We've got speakers. We've got shenanigans, but all kinds of stuff. I personally like to really fo focus on the message rather than the mess, but I will qualify. I'm an alcoholic. I earned my seat here. I grew up in an alcoholic household with a drug addict and alcoholic dad. It sucked. If you want to read about my childhood, it's written in ink in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I'll go ahead and talk about some of the mess a little bit. I didn't quite feel right as a kid all the time. You know, I would have a friend that was like kind of codependent with me, you know, and like I'd have a bestie and like something would happen and I'd have a new bestie, but I could never have like a whole big group of friends. Um, it just never happened. I was always pretty pissed off. They talk about my disposition in the in a couple places in the big book, particularly in the doctor's opinion, where I'm restless, I'm irritable, I'm discontent. Uh, in fourth grade, I ran out of fourth graders to beat up. So I moved on to fifth graders. They were bigger than me. It didn't last long. And I continued to find ways to separate myself from other people. Middle school sucked too, because you know my, my same behavior just continued to, to follow me. It, it was rough. I was angry. You know, there was a lot of things going on in my household. I wasn't taught a lot of coping skills and stuff. My mom was really codependent. My dad was, you know, my dad. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, my dad uh, decided to get sober when I was 12 years old, trying to fix his marriage. It didn't work out, but I went to my first 12-step meeting. I didn't know what they talked about. All I know is I got a little white book and a little white keychain. I'm forever grateful that I got to do that because by the time I started getting into some serious consequences of the law, I knew that it would be okay for me to sit around in a 12-step meeting. That happened when I was 17 years old. And I, um, you know, I started going to meetings, but it was uh, strange. Like I had to get my slip signed and stuff. And I was busy. You know, I had to go like once every couple of weeks. And like, that was a lot. Back then, I don't really know if I was an alcoholic or not. A lot of people think they were at birth. I don't know what I subscribe to. I really don't. But I know I'm an alcoholic now. The reason is, is despite negative consequences, once I start, I can't stop. And once I stop, I can't stay stopped. I can do the with or without the solemn oath, just like it talks about in the chapter more about alcohols in chapter three in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I can be given sufficient reason. I can be given really good reasons. My kid's mom wanted me to go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I wasn't about that life then. I didn't want to because that didn't work. And what the truth was is I hadn't worked Alcoholics Anonymous. I hadn't worked a set of steps. I would go to the meetings. I would use it as group therapy, and I wouldn't get into it. You know, I would talk about me and my problems. And, you know, they talk about in the big book, that literally being selfish and self-centered is the root of all of our problems. And, you know, here I am talking about myself and my problems. And I'm, I'm not even interested in the solution. People are talking about it. They're written on the wall. They're written there, right there and how it works. We read it in most meetings, you know, and I, I wanted nothing to do with it. I was too good for it. They wanted to talk about God. I was angry about God. I didn't believe in God, but I was angry about something I didn't believe in. I mean, figure this stuff out. I can't. Moving forward, you know, I continued to experience negative consequences, some of them legal, a lot of them emotional. I'd have uh, wrecked relationships. My mom eventually divorced me. Drinking had a very, very big part of that. Uh, my mistress was the bar and my friends and little crystal and powdered versions of, of alcohol that make you stay up all night. I'd like to disappear for entire weekends. This is good husband material, right? And so I, like my dad, that I never wanted to be or be like, I uh, found myself with my tail between my legs going to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous trying to fix my marriage, still trying to manage and control things to suit me. Luckily, I found a sponsor, and that sponsor got me down and dirty with a set of steps, took me through the book. You know, I started to write some stuff down, and I got to look at, you know, the, there's this thing called a, an inventory that we do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you haven't had the chance to do that yet, I highly recommend finding a sponsor, um, any of these people with a star next to their name, and really anybody that'll do it. If you haven't worked a set of steps, just find a sponsor. You don't have to worry about having a red sponsor or a blue sponsor or a green sponsor or a polka dotted sponsor. Just get one. You're looking at a life raft. You don't need to worry about the color and the shape and everything. You can work on that later. Please get a sponsor. That inventory process where I get to look at who they are and what they did to me and how it affects me is really monumental to my recovery. 
because it's really easy for me to talk about somebody else and what they did to me and how it affects me. It's the genius of the, of the way the inventory is set up. I'm pissed off at you because you did some shit to me. It's affecting my pride, my security, my, uh, my self-esteem. What else I got here? I got an inventory right here. Um, you know, my personal relations, my ambitions, my sex relations, my pocketbook, you know, all the stuff, right? It's really eye-opening because when I, when I put pen to paper and I start looking at stuff, I start to see the truth. Last night I was doing some inventory. I'm just going to share it with y'all. My old landlord, right? I just recently went through an eviction. I was forced evicted out of my apartment. They gave me a 90 day no cause notice. That's legal here in Oregon because they wanted to jack up the rent. I had no choice but to move. And my rent was going up because the market went up. And how does this affect me? This affects my personal relations. I had to call in favors of friends and family. That affects them, right? I have to like pull them in. It affects my pocketbook. I only make so much money. I don't want to give up more of it. It affected my personal ambitions. I wanted to remain living there for a while longer. You know, I wanted to stay there until my kids graduated high school. It affected my security. I literally had to find a new place. And like, this is my home, you know, like I've made up a home here. Like my friends who to come over there, you know, I used to have meeting in my house. And then I get to look at this other part. Some sponsors will call this the fourth column. And this is where we look at where we're selfish, self-seeking, dishonest, and afraid. And this is so difficult when you have a justifiable resentment. Like this landlord's a dick, but I get to look at where my mistakes are. Where am I to blame in this resentment? Because I want to be free of this resentment. Because if I'm not free of this stuff, I start harboring these things. I hold on to them. And I stay pissed off for a really, really long time. Years. And my experience has shown me that I know one way to get relief. And that's through substances and or people. I'm either going to bang some chicks or I'm going to like do drugs and alcohol. That's what's up. I don't want to live that way anymore. So I work on this solution in Alcoholics Anonymous. Where was I selfish? I felt like I had a right to live and occupy someone else's property indefinitely. I didn't own it. They're going to make their own choices. End of story. I can feel however I want, but there's the fact. I'm selfish. Okay, I can do that. Self-seeking. Again, I wanted to continue living as I had been in a place I didn't own. Where was I dishonest? I pretended I was okay with it. I even supported my landlord's decision. I was nice about it because I wanted my deposit back. Selfish, self-seeking, and self-centered. I was afraid. This is where I was frightened. I was scared of the financial cost of living somewhere else and my ability to take care of that. I was scared of having to find a new place to live in this rental market. My rent went up 40%. Like, I don't know about you guys, but I didn't get a 40% raise last year. This is ridiculous. But again, I want to be free of this. So I'm going to talk to my sponsor about this and we're going to look at some of my character defects. We're going to look at some of my shortcomings and then we're, we're going to see if I'm willing to make an amends for this. You know, what does it look like? You know, it might be just praying for them. I don't know yet. I'm going to go over that with a sponsor because I can't think clearly. I have a thinker up here that gets me in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous where I have to do stuff like believe in God, go to meetings, talk about steps, and listen to people's garbage all the damn time. Like, I have to do this stuff. I'm sick. And if I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know for certain, but I know from my track record, I'm probably going to drink. And usually when I start drinking, I start driving. And then I put my community at risk. I drive with my kids in the car. I've done all kinds of stupid shit when I'm drunk. And it's not okay. And so it's not just about me anymore. It's about everybody else around me that is affected by my alcoholism. I used to think it was just me, but I have since been able to look at things in a, from a wider scope and not just me and my feelings and like me sitting in my apartment. You know, eventually I'm going to interact with somebody else. And eventually I am not going to have alcohol. And untreated alcoholism is not a good look on me. I'm not comfortable to be around. I'm not trustworthy. I'm not lovable. Nobody wants to listen to me because all I do is bitch about my problems because I have no solution. So my sponsor started suggesting that um, I pray and meditate if I'm looking at it. And at first I was a little reluctant to do that. And I don't really know why. Because I, I used to go to these meditation meetings and they had nothing to do with Alcoholics Anonymous other than they also meditate. And um, they would do Zen meditation where you'd like sit there in silence. And I would have a really profound experience with it. And I was like, okay, I got enough of that. And then I started bringing girls I was dating to... Um, to those meditation meetings because like I was all spiritual and Zen and stuff. And it completely took away from um, the whole reason I was doing that in the first place. So I was a little reluctant to do it, but I think I got desperate enough because I just kind of wake up restless, irritable, and discontent. Those bedevilments on page 52, if you don't know what those are, go look on page 52, see if you identify. I'm experiencing all those things. So I started doing it. I don't do it perfect. I'll go make coffee. And the next thing I know, my mind's spinning. What am I going to do today? I got to do this work, expert, et cetera. You know, why isn't this? Why isn't that? Da, 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 da. And when I pray and meditate in the morning, I just kind of get some quick relief. 
and I know I'm going to be okay. I tend to have better days. This morning I did it. I had a pretty profound experience today at work. I, I've been there for a little while now, and I took over this guy that was retiring's position. I'm an accountant. I trade. Through the you know miracles of God and Alcoholics Anonymous, I was able to go back to school a handful of years ago, and now I'm like working with that degree. They gave me my own office today in the corner, and I have a window, and I have a desk, and I have like little things that I can hang up pictures and stuff. Like I can hide stuff in there. I can like put snacks in the drawer, and like I've never like really had anything like that before. I have a little window that I can slide open and ask my boss questions, you know, like the monk in, in Roger Rabbit, where he's like, what's the password? I could be like, hey, man, how do I, how do I reconcile, um, you know, the, this production here? I don't know. It's profound to me. I, I named my plant. Um, I have a little, like, office plant, and I named it Esmeralda. You know, it's, it's all through the benefits of doing this work. You know, I, I got a bunch of things I didn't want, and um, a lot of things didn't go my way. I didn't get back together with my kid's mom. I started doing this YPA gig. If you've ever done YPA committee work, I highly suggest you work a set of steps and get stay in touch with your sponsor. It's rough out there, but I wouldn't change it for the world. This year, I've been doing outreach all over the uh, the West Coast. I've been on a couple of panels. I, I spoke at Wacky Paw. I spoke at Whiskey Paw in Washington, and uh, I got to go to Aki Paw, which was great. Aki Paw is this huge conference out in California. If you should go to Anaheim this year or this next year, you should go. It's amazing. And when you're in a population center like that, it's going to be huge. This year it was in Visalia, which is a tiny little town south of Fresno. And it was still amazing. I had a great time. I really connect with YPOC because I came into Alcoholics Anonymous when I was young. You know, going to your, you know, bell curve of Alcoholics Anonymous meetings, I, I kind of felt a part of, and that's not what I was trying to feel. And young peoples of Alcoholics Anonymous and YPOC, I'm a part of. And I get to participate and I get to share my story. You know, we, we do this thing, we, we call it get in the car, right? You know, we're, we get afraid and we're like reluctant to get in the car. You're like, I don't want to get in the car with strangers. And I'm like, dude, I used to buy drugs from people I didn't know in cars. And now I'm afraid now that I'm sober to go hang out with sober people. Like for real? Like, you know, like some things baffle me, but I highly encourage you to get in the car and attend some YPA events. Even if it's just a barbecue, come hang out with us. We're, we're all over the place. I have a friend that keeps wanting me to go to, to Europe and I can't really afford it right now. And I just got this, you know, job that's amazing and stuff. So I, I have to decline and say maybe next year. I highly encourage people to get involved with YPA. Had I stayed sober from my first time in YPA, I'd have a lot more time. But COVID was rough and I, I married my co-chair from my YPA committee and uh, we were going through a divorce and I was pretty dry. I wasn't working steps. I wasn't sponsoring people. A drink sounded good and I didn't have a solution. And so I started drinking. It was pretty miserable because it was COVID. It's not like I could go out to the bar. It's not like I could socialize. It was just me and drinking. And it, it got boring really fast. It got really lame and sad. I started uh, hitting up Zoom meetings through uh, a friend I used to sponsor. He kept hitting me up. He's like, hey, we're doing this thing. Hey, we're doing this thing. Hey, we're doing this thing. And finally, I was like, all right, dude, I'll hit up a meeting. You know, I'm pretty miserable. I'm not doing anything else. So I hit up a meeting and I, I kept going out to meetings. Um, I'm really glad he reached out. So if you guys like get to know some people and you know they're out there, just hit them up a little bit. You know, it doesn't have to be like every day and you don't have to be up their ass. Just ask them how the fuck they're doing. You know, without judgment, you know, you're not going to catch alcoholism by talking to somebody. You know, you probably already have it. Use your character defects, you know, use that manipulation, use that dishonesty to get them back in the rooms. You might save their life. Just saying. I have a sponsee right now. I did it too recently. Do that shit. God gave you brains to use.